Welcome to the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. It is a great honor to introduce today Jorge Arrocha from Cuba, who will be giving a lecture on freedom, necessity, and the other introduction to Cuban philosophy. Jorge Arrocha holds a PhD in philosophical sciences and a degree in Marxist-Leninist philosophy. The scope of his research and teaching includes Latin American philosophy, history of philosophy, and continental philosophy. <laughs> He was professor in the philosophy department at the University of Havana and academic director of the philosophy program of Calasan's Cultural Center in Cuba and Christopher Columbus University in Mexico. He's the author of the book, A Useless Passion, Death and Freedom in the Philosophical Work of Jean-Paul Sartre. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. So I would like to start um, thanking you and the Institute of Philosophy for the invitation. I know it's a very difficult morning. Uh, in the middle of the week, many people are working, but it doesn't matter if we are few, at least uh, we are the ones interested in the topic. So my presentation is quite long because this is a, this is a result of two or three different moments in my career um, there in the University of Havana. So I have here, this is like a Frankenstein with different topics, but I tried to encompass all these uh, different topics into one. Just very brief introduction to the, what we call Cuban philosophy, which is a very polemic term, I know that. Uh, in any case, I will refer, of course, the concept of freedom, necessity, and the other as the main concepts with a long-standing tradition, of course, in the Western philosophy, but as the main concepts to understand also what is Cuban uh, philosophy or Cuban intellectual history, so on and so forth, there are different uh, denominations for the same content. Um, I was working mostly in the last nine years in the university in continental philosophy, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Paul Sartre, Michel Foucault. So my approach to the Cuban thinking, ironically, passed through all these uh, thinkers and mostly the European tradition. But it uh, doesn't matter. In any case, um, I, I, w I want first to, to go most probably to the most common idea we have about Cuban philosophy. And when we ask what is Cuban philosophy or, or if there is any Cuban philosophy, I think the first idea we have in our mind is that obviously what we have is Latin American philosophy. In, in that order, of course, this is very problematic because Latin American philosophy uh, have been also used to refer different uh, contents like Spanish American, Hispanic American, Ibero American philosophy, Latino, Latina philosophy. Therefore, what we call Cuban philosophy, uh, it will be a, a more complex um, concept or notion depending on your point of view uh, regarding these other areas. So the other, the other uh, idea at the very beginning of the presentation is that, of course, I have to be honest with you, I mean, if we take into consideration the uh, most traditional concepts in philosophy, for example, if we take as a point of reference uh, Hegel, the work of Hegel, which is a big deal and a big problem in Cuba because, you know, the work of uh, Hegel is one of the theoretical presuppositions of Marxism-Leninism. Uh, if we take this into consideration, we cannot say that in Cuba we have a philosophy. What we have is a whole movement of intellectuals, historians, politicians, even artists and writers uh, reflecting on the Cuban reality, politics, economy, and all these topics since colonial times. However, for other authors, we do have philosophy, and this philosophy is Marxism. So let's see the most common uh, trends regarding this question, if there is philosophy in Cuba and the characteristics so we have a group represented by the professor, by Professor Alexis Hardines, is most probably the only prestigious professor we have working on topics like phenomenology uh, and also early modern philosophy at the same time. So according to Hardines, what is currently done in Cuba by way of philosophy is not philosophical, not Cuban. So we don't have philosophy in Cuba. That's it. It's very clear, it's very honest in his point of view. His argument is a little bit complicated. I cannot describe the whole argument that Hardines uh, made. Uh, we have like half an hour only. Um, in front of Hardines, then we have a group of professors represented by Isabel Monal, uh, PhD from Harvard, Isabel Monal. PhD from Harvard uh, University. She's Cuban and she's uh, most probably the, yeah, the most important representative of Marxist-Leninist philosophy in Cuba. Marxist-Leninist philosophy in Cuba, just like that. And according to Isabel Monal, 
uh, this happened because we can find in Cuba a system based on the objective laws on history and society and the dialectical method. This happened in Cuba after 1971 with the introduction of Marxism-Leninism, the entrance of Cuba in the Comecon will receive all this influence from the Soviet thinking and therefore if this happened in 1971 today also we have Marxist-Leninist philosophy and all this is spread through the whole educational system at different levels, different faculties, etc. And in between uh, an eclectic position of thinkers that say we don't have philosophy because if we follow the original teaching of Karl Marx, uh, Karl Marx never uh, tried to elaborate or to define a philosophy. In fact, Karl Marx was against the German idealism. So <clears throat> this uh, added to other elements of, as a result that for this group of thinkers, and I'm referring professors of history of philosophy, even some politicians, writers, artists, etc. Uh, so for this group, we don't have philosophy, but that's not a negative sign. Instead of that, it's very positive and is healthy for the future of the Cuban thinking. So having in mind these uh, three positions, uh, when we see the, we have of course some coincidence and all of us, we, um, we, we think that the beginning of this uh, philosophical thinking or intellectual movement, depending on your position, began at the end of 18th century with the word of this uh, man, Jose Agustin Caballero, Jose Agustin Caballero. Um, the whole history of the Cuban thinking or intellectual reflection, uh, during all this history we will find, uh, for example, this characteristic, the instrumentality. What is the meaning of instrumentality? That they will take, they will use philosophy as a tool for the transformation of the society. So in this case, of course, we're speaking about very practical philosophy. Then the diversity, because of the different sources from where they are taking uh, concepts and ideas, and that the last one, that the Marxism, without any doubt, represented a breaking point in the 20th century after the Cuban Revolution. You can be against, you can be in favor, but Marxism-Leninism, or in general, Marxism, not only that reading from the Soviet Union, Marxism in general uh, represented a breaking point. So, in other level of the analysis, we have, of course, the historical perspective. In this case, what happened is very interesting. If we, if we make a parallel, a comparison between the Latin American history of philosophy and then the Cuban, we realize that in Latin America we can find at least five periods. I'm not going to enter in each one of them uh, because of the time. But in the case of Cuba, we have three. Colonial, Republic, and also Revolution after 1959. Uh, in this case, for example, this is very interesting because uh, when you take the handbooks or uh, the books about Latin American philosophy, usually this uh, account of facts starts start, uh, with the um, pre-Columbian cultures, with the whole cosmology, etc. But in the case of Cuba, we cannot trace the beginning back there before 1492. There is no beginning. There is a total emptiness in the case of Cuba, and I think it's the case also of most of the Caribbean. This is a, a very unique characteristic when you compare Caribbean and Latin America or Central America and South America. Why the emptiness? Okay, we all know, we also, um, how is this movie I was seeing yesterday, by the way, um, the name uh, Apocalypto. Okay, so we all have in mind all this, and also, of course, there are a lot of research about that the Taino population, that was a population of natives that used to live in Cuba and in the Caribbean at that moment, disappeared completely. And disappeared uh, not only because of the exploitation, also because of the massive suicides that happened there. Suicides, most of them. We are speaking about a period of time of 32 years. I think I don't have the numbers here. But it goes from approximately 110,000 uh, natives living in Cuba at that moment, Tainos, down to 800, around 830 Tainos after 32 years and because of all this process of colonization. So we don't have a cosmology, we don't have mythology, we don't have religion, and we go straight to the end of 18th century with the work of the gentleman I mentioned it before, Jose Agustin Caballero. Then Republic and of course finally Revolution. During the colonial period, we have a huge confrontation between scholasticism and uh, anti-scholasticism uh, we have all this name as important uh, representative, 
Um, in this confrontation, we will receive also the influence of early modern philosophy in Cuba and enlightenment. Thanks to this reception, uh, Jose Agustin Caballero will create the most important concept in this tradition, in the tradition of the Cuban thinking, the concept of electivism opposed to eclecticism. This is a big deal, okay? Because we are not speaking only about the reception of different tradition. We're not speaking only about the fact that Cuba is an island and because of the, its privileged position in the middle of the Caribbean Sea is always in the middle of the whole trade between Europe and Latin America receiving influence from Central South America, United States. It's not only about that, it's about the independence and the freedom of Cuba. Okay, so um, in this case, electivism, according to Jose Agustin Caballero, has to do with the free will choosing the elements of truth that help us to first criticize the dogma imposed by the scholasticism and second to bring the human freedom back to its original place. It's, it sounds of course very abstract and general but in the later work of Jose Agustin Caballero and uh, also Felix Varela, Jose de la Luz y Caballero and Jose Martí, the national, sorry, the national hero of Cuba, we will find a whole development of a philosophy of freedom, philosophy of education, mm, philosophy associated, of course, with politics. We have to bear in mind that we are in the middle of the colonialism, mm, the colonial system that in the case of Cuba began in 1492 and finished it in 1898 with the wars of independence. So these are the thinkers and philosophers that thought from before the ideological freedom of Cuba. Let's continue. I don't have, uh, of course, time to speak about the whole political situation during the Republic, but I, I think you know already the name of Fidel Castro, you know, the, or Raul Castro, of course, Batista, um, the president of Cuba first from 1940 to 1944, that was considered the first dictatorship. Um, also, we have Gerardo Machado, uh, which, by the way, is also dictatorship and was before Batista. Then the second uh, period in office of Batista from 1952 to 1959. So we are speaking about a, a period of time pretty controversial uh, in our history. And in the first half of the 20th century, we have the influence of the positivism with Enrique José Arona and then the Cuban Journal of Philosophy and the Cuban Society of Philosophy, the first one founded in 1946. I will refer only to the Cuban Journal of Philosophy because it's the most important example during the whole period of the Republic from 1902 to 1959. Nine. As you can see, the themes were around existentialism, phenomenology. We are speaking about thinkers like Jean Paul Sartre, the, the same Enrique José Barona, Francisco Romero, Ortega Gasset, so all this in this uh, Cuban Journal of Philosophy, which by the way is uh, also controversial because of the opinion they will have regarding this dialectic between the freedom of Cuba, the necessity imposed by the other, in this case it's not Spain, we are speaking about United States. So according to Piñera Yera in his book Panorama de la Filosofía Cubana, Panorama of the Cuban Philosophy, he explained, however, I am one of those who understand that the study of local philosophical problems should go after some training in philosophy as such. Here we have again the same argument, like uh, we cannot think in the philosophy of Cuba if we don't go first to the general topics of philosophy, so on and so forth. Um, it's uh, longer than this uh, sentence. And after the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, most of the members of the Cuban Journal of Philosophy, they will uh, fled to United, they will go to United States, they will establish there and they will continue their work of this uh, journal. They will publish more issues, but they will finish after 1961, 1962. Let's continue. The revolution happened, as you may know, in 1959. Uh, this is, this is, also quite interesting because now we will start to see a philosophy really concerned uh, about the practical matters of this political movement. And I'm quoting Castro here, I, I put this uh, expression, this uh, idea of Castro, because most of the people tend to think that the revolution uh, started already with one defined ideology since the very beginning, and that's not the case. 
uh, at, at least it's my personal opinion, but it's really easy to defend that argument when you just check the whole ideology of the guerrilla uh, led by Fidel Castro from 1952 to 1959, and the only person that is reading Marxism-Leninism in the Sierra Maestra is Che Guevara. Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro at that moment, he's trying to defend a more national revolution, a nationalistic revolution, a Cuban one. Therefore, his readings about philosophy and what will happen at the very beginning, from 1959 to 1962, 63, is that we will have philosophers and thinking going back again to this electivism that I mentioned from 19th century. Okay, and trying to get information, concepts, ideas from different traditions, blend it, and then create the Cuban thinking. So Fidel Castro, 1959, there in the United States, this is one of the statements, this revolution is neither capitalist nor communist, etc., etc. Then in front of a journalist, after the insistence of this journal, of this uh, journalist, uh, he said, okay, our revolution is not communist, our revolution is not capitalist, our revolution is uh, green uh, like our palm trees, just like that. It's, it's the moment, it's the spirit of the time. So. I, I like to define the 60s in Cuba like the honeymoon period of the revolution. Jean Paul Sartre was there in 1960. He was two, exactly two times in Cuba. He traveled all over the island with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. And in all his talks, conversations and presentations, and also you can check it in Ideology and Revolution, one of the articles he published after his visit to Cuba, uh, you can check that uh, for Sartre, the most important thing that he saw in Cuba was that they were taking time to define not only the philosophy, but then also the ideology of a whole political process. But the revolution passed also through a process of radicalization. The, let's say the, the, the best example of this uh, period of radicalization Che Guevara. Che Guevara and, and Juan Se, socialism and the man in Cuba. And why radicalization? Because already at this moment, uh, we have terrorist attacks organized from the United States. We have a huge confrontation. Cuba had to choose between the United States and the Soviet Union in the context of the Cold War. But in parallel to this, in 1967, will appear critical thinking of Pensamiento Critico. is the journal, scientific journal of the Department of Philosophy. The Department of Philosophy of the University of Havana was created, the department I was working uh, before to come here to Belgrade. Okay, of course, not in 1960. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was born in 1985. But in any case, uh, critical thinking was created in 67, the Department of Philosophy, this group, of intellectuals also they will create the first national publishing house in Cuba and they will publish the work of Gramsci, they will publish of course Sartre, friend of the revolution till 1971 uh, when happened the Padilla, Padilla's case. Um, then this uh, journal with a critical perspective they, they will approach, they, 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 will, they will go mostly to the Marxism, but this Marxism from the Western point of view, not the Marxism-Leninism. This, of course, implied a problem. This is a problem for, for, for the moment, especially 1971. But before to go to 1971, let me see if I can find here. I cannot find it right now. Okay, yes, it's here. Between the authors that they published in critical thinking or pensamiento critico, we will find, for example, your Lukács, Karl Korsch, Sartre, Perry Anderson, Paul Ricker, Eric Hobsbawm. We have Adorno, of course, Ernesto Guevara, Aníbal Quijano, Roque Dalton. So this is a project of critical thinking, a, an eclectic project, and trying also to redefine that concept that they took from 19th century philosophy. Now, in 1971, uh, this is this is quite difficult because this is even more recent. The first uh, in the first research I participated, uh, I mean this one was about Cuban thinking, and, and I decided to take this uh, this line to go into critical thinking and uh, see what kind of philosophy they were doing there and the impact in social science in Cuba and in the humanities. The first time I went to the library, the library of our faculty just to go and review all the numbers and make, you know, the whole state of arts of the research, etc. That when I asked for the, for the issues, if they had something there, they told me, no, we don't have. How you don't have? 
I mean, it's critical thinking. This is the, the most famous intellectual project we have had here in the university. No, we don't have. No, we don't have. After two months, I asked my professor, Professor, what happened? I mean, it's impossible. This is the, this is the journal from the Department of Philosophy. How oh, you don't have the journal? They have the journal, he told me. They have the journal. Of course, they had the journal in the cave. They used to call the cave the, the store of the library where they used to put all the golden books, as they said, you know. Of course, was not to the public, was not to the, to the students, only for certain professors and certain researchers. In any case, Cuba today is living in a different moment, so if you go there, you can, if you want, I have all the issues, so I can borrow one of them. <laughs> So nothing, 1971, the introduction uh, of Marxism-Leninism in Cuba after the, the Comic-Con and the restablishing of relations between Cuba and the Soviet Union. We are speaking about a very complex uh, moment. It has political ramifications, whole extension there. Uh, so this began in 1971 after the first Congress of Education and Culture one of the results is the period that we call the great five-year period that includes negative features of dogmatism and intolerance in the intellectual sphere, in the philosophical sphere. And dogmatism, I will read here just one fragment of the book of Martínez Heredia, one of the uh, professors of, the department, of that department of philosophy and director of critical thinking. Dogmatism involved much, much more than textbooks or monographs. Was the attribution of correction or evil to all thought before its exercise, which fixed positions around what exists and what should be studied and discussed, and ordered general opinions in politics, economics, education, even in the appreciation of arts. By returning to the speculative philosophy of nature in the name of Marxism and postulate the supposedly scientific enlightenment of everything as an ideological obligation, they elaborated a coherent instrument of domination that closed the way to the development of socialism. The socialism, of course, this concept of socialism, according to the professors and members of Pensamiento Critico, Critical Thinking, the magazine. Along with these characteristics in the, in the academy, okay, specifically, we are speaking about the conformation of the national program, of the national curriculum of the career of Marxism-Leninism. They, they open the career uh, all over the country in all the universities even in institutions and college from high school, senior high school. And even today, we have something similar, of course, but after 1999, this program changed. But in some schools still, they continue studying Marxism, Leninism from high school. Imagine, okay? So, um, in parallel with this, to this process, we will have the dissemination of concepts and categories in the social practice that attempted against the development of culture and literature. We have, for example, uh, all these artists and writers that were sent to uh, labor uh, camps, forced labor camps called UMAP. UMAP, that's the name of these uh, places in Cuba. I don't know, do you know Silvio Rodriguez? the trovador, the singer, okay, Silvio Rodriguez was in UMAP, Pablo Milanes also was in UMAP, and we have even more examples because homosexuals, Catholics, intellectuals were considered the dangerous elements of the system because they were not real revolutionary. The Department of Philosophy was closed in 1971. The, the journal, the Pensamiento Critico, uh, disappeared from all the bookstores and libraries, as I told you before, and um, they destroyed the house of the Department of Philosophy. When you go to Havana, I'm pretty sure some of you will go there, uh, when you go to Havana, next to the, to, the, to the main campus, there is a parking lot. That parking lot was the Department of Philosophy. They just destroyed that with bulldozers, just like that. That happened in 1971. Then we have this period, the extension of all this to the cultural sphere, from 71 to 76, homosexuals, members of the LGTB community, Catholics, they, would be, uh, they, they, they couldn't go inside institutions, educational and cultural institutions in Cuba. That's why the gray uh, five-year period was a definition for all this uh, moment. Just to finish with this, I want to mention the fact that in the Congress of 1971, the Congress of uh, Education, this Congress of Education and Culture, they created 
a new category for social science and humanity. The name was Elvis Presleyanism, after Elvis Presley. And after Elvis Presley, because Elvis Presleyanism identified all these negative tendencies that reminded them the uh, features and concepts from the capitalist world. Not only the rock and roll, but more things, okay? So in any case, um, officially till 1976, but we will see some of these characteristics even in the teaching of philosophy till the night, till uh, um, the 80s, at the end of the 80s, just before the fall of the world and the disintegration of the Soviet Union. In parallel with the disintegration of the Soviet Union, we will have a more interest on, uh, again, on thinkers like Gramsci, uh, Habermas, we'll have debates, a lot of debates, especially about Gramsci, the concept of hegemony, uh, social, um, civil society, political society, this relation. And uh, then the special period, 1991-1994, nothing, just nothing. I mean, this, this probably was the, 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 the worst moment in the history of the Cuban Revolution. There was no time to think with only a salary of one dollar a month, imagine. In 1994, we had, or they had, uh, only one student of philosophy in the faculty. Only one, okay? But then after 1991 and 2000, of course, the whole situation has changed. As you can see, there is a great concern in the Q1 thinking for this uh, concept of freedom. When we go to different moments, when we, when we open the, the, the history of philosophy, or the Q1 thinking, or intellectual movement in Cuba, we will find this concern about freedom, we will find always the, this concern about the necessity or the norms imposed by another, sometimes the other, uh, close, in a very uh, close way to Lacan. Uh, so, so sometimes the other is not only an external other, it's not only Spain, it's not only the United States, it's not only the colonization or neo-colonization, cultural or physical, etc. Sometimes it's even internal other, like happened after 1959. Having said all this, and just almost at the very end of the, at the end of the presentation, we can say that the intellectual effort of a varied group of thinkers seeking the practical transformation of reality as its ultimate goal is the characteristic or the main characteristic of this Cuban philosophical thinking. So in front of us right now, there are a lot of challenges. One of them associated, okay, with political science, social science, humanity, there is a strong collaboration today between the faculty and all these areas. Uh, regarding the definition of socialism, especially after the process that began with Raul Castro, a whole process of redefinition of the Cuban society, privatization of the Cuban society. This, of course, led to other kind of topics like engagement, like, of course, the presence of the subject in the reality, etc., etc. Media and communication policy, of course, internet, the transformation, let's say, of the subjectivity of the subject. Uh, in their reality with these new characteristics. The teaching and scope of philosophy today is, of course, broad than it was in the 80s, in the 70s. Today you can find other kind of topics. We have more continental philosophy. We have even analytic philosophy, which is very strange in the case of Latin America, as you can see. Okay, of course, there are, there are a lot of examples, but when you compare with other areas uh, around the world, it's less. The teaching and scope of philosophy is more diverse and, of course, philosophy in Cuba or the intellectual movement in Cuba has in front uh, these huge problems, the relations with the United States and the relations with Latin America. Because of the time, I cannot refer the whole uh, history or all the problematics with United States, but, but this, is, this is a deal and, and this is not so abstract. This is not only about uh, propaganda in the TV or in the newspapers. We're speaking about embargo that the, uh, last more than uh, 50 years, around 50 years, sorry, and we are speaking about the impossibility to have normal relations with academics in the United States, even with the institutions that will fund your research, that will fund your findings. So this is a problem. And, the, and this is not because the United States prohibit that in Cuba. That, that's not the core of the embargo. The problem with the embargo is that the United States prohibit third countries their organizations, institutions, eh, they, they prohibit the normal trade or relations with Cuba. Mm? So in the case of economy, it's clear, it's more evident, but this also happens in the case of the academic sphere, and in philosophy especially. We only have one event 
every two or three years is a meeting between Cuban and American philosophers. That's the only content that we have, of course, otherwise, you, um, except if you go to the United States by yourself, or it's something like private. To redefine the relations with Latin America uh, in a context very difficult, uh, let, let's see what happened now uh, in Brazil. The situation is horrible. Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, uh, Mexico, thanks God, uh, it turns to, other, uh, to the other side. But in all these debates in Latin America today, is Cuba. It's always Cuba as a symbol, as a sign of the Castro communism, Castro communism, the Marxism Leninism, even though today we cannot say that we have a strong school in Marxism Leninism, because we don't have, honestly. Okay, we are trying again to redefine the whole scope of philosophy in Cuba, the challenge that we have in front of us, etc., but we don't have like a well-defined school in Marxism Leninism, I don't consider that. But in any case, the position of Cuba there is very problematic in Latin America, okay? And we have to rethink also on that. And a very important topic, the independence, sovereignty, and self-determination. Again, we go back to the topic of the freedom. This is the core of the whole Cuban thinking. Then, the very definition of whether or not there is philosophy in Cuba happens to be a political operation from its origins. Because in each case, there is more at stake than the theory. It is the practice of being or belonging to a specific locus. To be or not to be something, in this case, happens to be a matter or to be or not to be somewhere. This somewhere has been det de determined by the imposition of norms, which we translate at, as necessity from foreign powers during the whole history of Latin America, and of course, during the whole history of Cuba. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, please, I'm here. Oh, sorry.